Hey there, my name is Ryan, and in this video, I'm going to tell you about one of the number one ways that board games grab my attention. They draw me in, it makes me want to play them, and that's by giving me something unique, some ability different from the other players sitting around the table, and that's something we call variable player powers. Think for a second about first-person shooter video game. Let's say all players start with the exact same weapons, like just a pistol, and everyone goes around, and that's the only weapon they have to fight against each other, and the game well, could, be, could be great. It could be a really interesting matchup to see who is the best person at using that one starting weapon. But where these games shine, where they get really interesting, is that all the players kind of have a different thing they're good at. Like maybe one person has really high health, but they're only good at fighting in close range, while someone else is a really low health sniper. Many board games will also infuse their games with tons of interest in much the same way, by giving players some things they can do that no one else around the table can do. And that's a good basic definition of variable player powers that we'll use in this video. There are player powers, things that players can do, but they vary from player to player. They could be simple, like you know, getting a bonus coin when you build a building, or really complicated, like you have different army units that fight in different ways from everyone else's. A really great example of this is a board game called Dune Imperium. In the center of the table, there's a big board that has all these spots that pretty much anyone can go to. That part is the same for every player, but sitting in front of everyone is your specific character, basically based on the characters from the movie. So one person, when they do actions, can acquire extra money. So when they need to do things that cost money, they're going to have more money than every player. It kind of gives that player something special just they can do. Another player is better getting spice. Another player doesn't do either one of those things. He just gets to peek at the top card of his deck and say, hmm, what's coming up next? Okay, so he can strategize off knowing what card is coming up next. So all these powers give you a focus in the game. When you're playing Dune, you're like, I'm really good at this. I should probably try to win by getting victory points here because I have more money than everyone else. So I can afford more workers before everyone else can afford them. And that's one of the primary reasons so many people enjoy variable player powers. Just dream up a universe where you play Monopoly, a game that not a lot of people liked anymore, but you played Monopoly and every single player was given a special ability. Like let's say your opponent gets $400 for pass and go. 400, that, that's double how much you could pass and go. How are you going to compete with that? Well, but you want to turn, get a dice re-roll. So if you don't like the roll you got, you can just re-roll and do something different. And then another player, instead of going to jail, can send one of you to jail. By the way, Hasbro, if you're looking for more ideas like this, just, just message me, I'm, I'm here. It would make it a much more interesting play if you had something that only you could do that was special to your character. Now this all leads to an important point. It's hard to make good variable player powers. It takes much more time than the five minutes I spent on making the Flame Monopoly examples I just gave you. And not only is it difficult to do, but it also requires a lot of play testing. Like let's take my Monopoly example one more time. And you played the game a hundred times with different players taking different powers. And the person that got 400 for passing go won 75% of the game. Well, if they won 75% of the games, it's not bound to think about the drawing board, kind of retweak things, try to maybe try to make it 300. They make it 300, now they can't win any of the games. So it's just a time consuming process to give people unique powers that can all do something against anyone else in the game or against the basic nature of the game, and then make it actually a balanced, even fun play. Now, Dude Imperium, I'd say, was fairly mild in its use of variable player powers. I mean, it's super fun. It's one of my favorite games of all time. But the core game remains a lot intact, and the variable player powers give you a little perk. Scythe, though, is an example of a game that's been super popular the last few years, which just takes it not one step, but many steps further. Every player is given their own player board, and on that player board, you have a unique ability that only you can do, much in the same way that Dune Imperium had that. But also, you have your four mechs, your machines of war sitting on that faction map. When you take them off and place them on the map, when you build them, you uncover four different special abilities. As you uncover them, you're gaining basically more special things for your faction. But on top of that, you also have an action map where you're going to say things like move, build, you know, recruit more people. And that gives every player a unique cost sometimes or reward for doing different actions, a different upgrade chain. And then beyond all that, there are actions up here and below that you can pair together into two actions at once. And every board has a different combination of action pairs with actions. Then on top of all of that, everyone has a unique setup. Like you might have a set that gives you more combat cards, but you know, less combat power, but also your spot in the board is going to have maybe you see surrounded by forest and mountains, someone else gets a village and a farm. Now that is an insane amount of variability in Scythe. One of the best things about playing Scythe is you get your faction and you get your action map, which is again, not the main board. You have two things you're going to look at and trying to think of what is the most efficient way I can use these two boards together as well as my location on the map, as well as my enemies around me and play the most efficient game possible. Now this kind of brings up a small sort of side point in that there can be a difference between variable player powers 
and variable player setup. Now some games like Scythe have both player setup differently and they have powers of the game that are different. But there are many war games that feature an asymmetric setup where at the beginning of the game you set up differently but once you go you all play by the same rules. Viticulture is another example. Viticulture, you start, you might have a different building someone soon have. Maybe you had a bonus worker to try to game with. Maybe you start with a little more money or more green cards. Everyone starts out slightly varied in Viticulture, but once the game gets going, you're all playing under the same rules for the rest of the game. But we haven't yet talked about my favorite kind of variable player power. And that's when a game gives you an ability so good, so strong, it seemingly breaks the game. My personal favorite example of this is a little game called Santorini, which is honestly one of my favorite games of all time. At its core, Santorini is a pure strategy game. No luck involved. You move here, you build a tower. You move here, you build a tower. You're trying to work your way up towers, staying on higher and higher levels. And basically, if you stand on a third level tower, you win. So the game comes down to strategizing, trying to block your opponent off. You can use each other's towers. There's no owning towers. So you're trying to get to that third level before they get to it and basically maneuver your pieces in such a way to wall them off so you can get there first before they can block you. Now that's good and it's really fun. It's actually a really interesting puzzle to say, I move, I build. That's my turn. You move, you build. Try to outsmart your opponent, get to that third level first. But what makes Santorini go from a good game to one of my favorite games, it comes with 30 variable player powers. So to start the game, you get one of these powers where you choose them and it gives you something special that breaks the game. It goes against the core mechanism of the game somehow. And it's so fun. Like there's one power called Pan. And every time I give this card to a new player, they always smile and they think, how can I lose now? What Pan lets you do, you don't have to stand on third level to win. All you have to do is go up two levels and then jump off to the ground level and it's over. You can be on a tower on the second level and be surrounded by seven ground level spaces. If you just step on any of those spaces, you win. When people see that power, they think, how could I possibly lose? But then maybe their opponent has a little card called Baya, and Baya says, if you move, and there's a person in front of you after you move, they die. What? This is a game about building buildings, and then one character can just kill the other characters delete their workers off the board, which of course make the rest of the game really easy if you're down a worker. But that's why this game is so great. Every time you see a matchup, and there's like over 400 matchups, right? There's 30 powers, they can all play against the 30 powers. And every time you play this game, you're like, how can I leverage my special ability, my ability that I could do this and maneuver, I don't have to get to the third level, I have to get to this. The buy-up player is thinking, how can I try to get that third level while leaving myself lined up with squares they want to move into because if they move in my line of sight, I can knock them off the board. So all these variable player powers basically just really boost the game in my opinion. It makes games so much more exciting to learn. I love when someone teaches you a new game and as they're opening the box up, they hand you a stack and then say, here, pick one from this stack of 10 boards. And you're like, I don't know how to play the game yet, but this person gets two cards instead of one. I want to get two cards. And so you get to have something unique. So you just learn a new game. You're trying to think about how to use your strategy better than anyone else. And on top of all that, it actually makes games much more replayable, right? I mean, if you play Scythe, there are 25 combinations in the base game of a faction and an action board that can be swapped out. So you can play the game five times. You didn't even come close to exploring all of them yet. And then Santorini again, for example, you have 30 different powers you can play through, but every single power that your opponent chooses, that matchup is going to greatly change the game again. So you just have hundreds of combinations, ways that it makes the game totally different. And one note on cooperative games, if you played modern cooperative games, you know they're kind of built on this variability, right? You play a game where you are all on the same team trying to accomplish something. If you all have the exact same strengths and ability and you're all working together, it gets a little plain. So almost every single cooperative game gives you something special that you can do and only you can do so your team has to rely on you to maybe move quicker or that's rely on you to like do negotiations, whatever that is, it's really kind of the hallmark of most cooperative games is giving you some cool thing to be able to help the team out with. I hope you enjoyed learning about variable player powers and possibly have something new to look out for and buying new games. Of course, follow the channel if you want to see more videos like this. I also do lots of playthroughs, some group playthroughs and some solo playthroughs and some videos where I just talk about games I like and some that I don't like. See you then.